Hello everyone, this is Omer Mekül. Uh, I am ITRP Computer Society Region 8 Coordinator and I am also uh, ITRP Computer Society Student and Young Professionals Activity Committee Watch Chair for VIP Activities. And now uh, we are organizing and we are starting our uh, CSYP meetup in this great congress, in this uh, CPS uh, 2021 uh, conference under uh, Cybermatics uh, Congress, and we are very glad to uh, we, uh, we are very thankful uh, to the conference organizers for this opportunity, and uh, we are very glad to uh, welcome the attendees uh, to make this uh, meetup. And normally uh, we were waiting. Uh, uh, normally we are waiting for our uh, president elect uh, Bill Grop who is the uh, who will be the president of the next year but i think there may be some connection problems that is why uh, he cannot uh, participate in our uh, meetup although he sent me an email uh, just 90 minutes ago uh, he can participate in this meetup so uh, it is better to continue uh, the member and geographic activities board uh, was chair uh, who is also our uh, Geographic Activity Committee Chair, Peter Major, uh, with his presentation. Uh, the floor is yours, Peter. And uh, by, by the way, yeah, yeah just let me say, uh, Peter is uh, also the uh, Geographic and Activity Committee Chair, so uh, he is responsible for all the chapters uh, all over the world. Uh, and he's also our uh, chair and uh, he's also a great mentor uh, and uh, very helpful and a great person beside a uh, very great volunteer and engineer and uh, i would like to uh, thank peter to joining this uh, meetup and now the stage is yours peter thank you omar i guess i should begin while we're waiting for bill but uh, maybe mm -hmm. the first thing i will do is i'm going to try to share my screen well, basically, I'm going to start by introducing me. I'm the chair of the Geographical Activities Committee. I've been involved with computing for a really long time, initially in system software, uh, designing compilers and languages for some mini computer startups and also for some specialized software houses worked on developing some database management systems and various pieces of communication infrastructure. Uh, more recent years, I've been more involved in bioinformatics, genomics, and computational biology. Uh, in the old days, I was secretary treasurer of the ACM Programming Languages Group and co-chair of some of their early conferences, Popol and PPLs. And I ran a local programming language group in the Boston area before later becoming chair of the Boston chapter of the IEEE Computer Society. And more recently, I spent three years chairing the Awards and Recognition Committee of the uh, Membership and Geographic Activities Board before this year becoming the chair of the uh, Geographic Activities Committee. And in light of what I was being asked to talk about today, I'm going to try to say something about getting how young professionals can get more involved in chapters and try to show you a path for networking, technical enlightenment, and career engagement. The uh, technical challenges that are ahead. Uh, basically, what you as young professionals are faced with in dealing with this world and how can chapters help? Well, look, there are 244 professional chapters in 70 countries and 599 student branch chapters. And one of our goals is to steer you to the right chapter to help you learn about some of the technical challenges and some of the underlying uh, tools and technologies which are available to help you solve some of them. Uh, I think at this conference, you may have been hearing a little bit about some of the problems having to do with security in a highly interconnected world as we move from doing computations on individual computers 
personal computers or shared time sharing computers to an interconnected internet of things where we have lots of sensors and other inputs coming in of uh, varying reliability and how to sort through misleading information and malicious actors to provide uh, correct computational results. In addition to that, we're dealing with a uh, inter highly interconnected biological world where the faster travel and, and better connections allow us or allow the spread of uh, dangerous diseases as we're experiencing now, now with the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the big challenges ahead for technical people more in the biotech community, but also in the uh, computational community is how to use our technology to help contain the spread of the pandemic. And there's a lot of work going on in things like support for contact tracing to uh, and, and testing to help control and monitor what's going on and also to help the biologists find which solutions work for which classes of people in terms of various kinds of interventions. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you probably all are beginning to experience climate change now. On the American West Coast, we have wildfires and lots of other parts of the world. We have hurricanes, typhoons, and flooding caused by plus very high temperatures uh, caused by uh, some of the changes as uh, temperatures, as, the, as, as climate becomes more <coughs> volatile with increased energy levels. On the purely computational level, we've seen the end of Moore's law that we can no longer uh, depend on uh, transistors getting faster and cheaper. So we've got more into a more parallel and distributed world. In addition to that, with mobile devices, we've become more concerned with power performance, battery life, and not just raw computational performance. The question then is, how can we as computer technologists help to solve all of these problems? And some of the new tools and technologies that have become available over the last few decades are things like blockchains and distributed ledgers, but uh, these also present new problems. <clears throat> Someone recently reported that Bitcoin mining now uses more energy than the country of Sweden and very likely the country of Australia as well. So uh, the trade-offs between energy use and uh, computational efficiency is becoming more important. In addition, as Moore's law has ended, we've become more dependent on a parallel comp and distributed computations to get things done. So instead of raw sequential performance uh, as traditional algorithms, uh, as it, uh, algorithm books have been talking about, we very often needed to transition to different algorithms that reduce communication costs and allow things to be to uh, take place more in parallel. And in addition to that, uh, as we've become come, come into exponential uh, growth in computation time and NP and the limitations of NP completeness, we've often had to resort to stochastic algorithms where we would get a correct answer most of the time or come within some bounds of an answer with high probability rather than trying to uh, produce an exact answer which takes an extremely long, an unrealistically long time. Uh, in addition to that, we are have new possibilities with quantum, quantum computing and quantum communication. Uh, quantum computing is still mostly a theoretical concept in terms of solving hard problems, but quantum communication uh, at, at least small distances can guarantee that a message can be delivered exactly once and uh, you will get some error condition if someone intercepts it. Uh, in addition to that, use, as, as we get more into robotics and automation and uh, naive users using the computer devices more, user interface engineering 
and uh, computer human interface is becoming much more of an issue. Uh, and one of the places that chapters can play a big role, for example, the Boston chapter will be having a, like, uh, I guess, seminar on some aspects of user interface engineering next month. And uh, one of the things I'll be talking about later is how uh, chapters, by sharing information in a virtually interconnected world, can bring you closer to more uh, technology that individual chapters aren't able to give you by themselves. Uh, another uh, important area that's uh, gotten a lot of publicity lately is machine learning and artificial intelligence, and especially as more larger uh, data sets become available, uh, basically try to uh, use matching based on machine learning to get to answers more quickly. Uh, has become one of the leading areas of both uh, computer research and applications to real world problems. And uh, I, I, I could talk, talk to you more about that. I, I, for example, have been recently using a uh, an app called Picture This, where you can point your iPhone at any plant and it will try to identify it for you. And it's actually quite useful if I go around on a walk and like, I find a plant I like that I might want to include in my garden, I can take its picture and get its identification. And I actually used that recently to identify a mushroom in my backyard as a head of the woods mushrooms that was actually quite edible. Uh, sensors and drones are becoming more important as you've been hearing in the uh, probably in your uh, conference on uh, the Internet of Things. And that also has two aspects. One, it allows you to monitor what's going on to solve problems like climate change and uh, disaster assistance. But at the same time, you're getting a large onslaught of additional data. And in addition, have the uh, additional issue of reliability of data and imposter data that you have to deal with, uh, possibly with the help of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, in addition to that, there are new areas that I in particular have become interested in the last uh, dec decade or so of synthetic computational biology, where people are trying to reprogram life forms using uh, programming technology, not just to program p computers, but to reprogram life with the use of CRISPR and other similar technologies. And that leads us back to where GAC, the Geographical Activities Committee, and chapters can play a role in this. I, I think there are four main areas where we can be useful. We can be useful in explaining new technologies with the help of both our distinguished visitor program and centrally organized seminars and lectures, and also by locally organized seminars where chapters can share specific uh, seminars and, uh, and topics of interest that they often arranged around universities uh, can make available to people outside of their immediate ge geographical area. Uh, chapters can be a really good source of networking, especially for young professionals to get introduced to people with similar interests. You can go there with a technical uh, programming problem uh, that you have of why your Python or Java program doesn't work, and maybe someone else has run into a similar problem. And in addition to uh, using Stack Overflow or querying Dr. Google, you might be able to find people who are running into similar problems who can give you pointers and help. And in addition to that, especially as younger members uh, running into more experienced industry people and academic people at your local chapters gives you an opportunity to get mentoring and advice. And we're hoping to promote that as we get uh, young professionals more involved in chapters. And then an additional area is I'm hoping to see us be able to organize joint efforts to solve some of the big problems or help provide small solutions to pieces of the big problems I mentioned earlier. And there are a lot of competitive competitions like uh, the MIT Solvent Pro uh, 
problem at various venture capital incubators like Y Incubator in the US and a lot of innovation centers at leading universities that uh, the local chapters can help give you pointers to as one part of their mentoring. And just to take this one step further, a while ago, we took a survey of what topics were of interest to chapters, and it turned out that the two things of greatest interest were security and machine learning. And then after that, there were, uh, can you read this? Uh, the current COVID pandemic uh, attracted a lot of interest. The Internet of Things was also one of the five top, th uh, top priorities. And a lot of people are programming in Python these days. There are a lot of other good programming. I, I, I think I, if you're interested in array processing, you should also be interested in Nuppy when you use Python. And some people prefer a language called Julia, which is like a more updated version of Python. And a lot of people who do systems programming are still using Java and C++ or even Fortran if they're doing scientific programming. But in any case, this is some example of where interest is these days. Uh, here's a list of some of the topics that are being addressed by and distinguished visitors in our distinguished visitor lecture program. And uh, let's see what we have here. And, and here are some typical chapter meetings that we've had in the uh, Boston chapter, some of the uh, topics that we've had locally that may be of wider interest. Uh, about a year ago, we had Charles Leeserson talk about the resurgence of software, software performance engineering and uh, what uh, software perform, what, what problems uh, software performance is, how software performance these days is different from how it was uh, a few years ago. Uh, communications is becoming much more of an issue than uh, raw that, that how many compute cycles you use. Uh, another recent, uh, we had uh, Leslie Valiant talk a little bit about some issues having to do with uh, machine learning and some of the problems having to do with uh, deciphering uh, what uh, uh, AI problems are really doing when they choose a particular match for or an identifying a, a picture or, or, or coming up with a solution. How do you debug machine learning uh, algorithms? And uh, we also had Sandy Pentland talk a little bit about uh, how do you recover from COVID-19. Sandy's been uh, very active in a number of things and also an economic advisor to the World Economic uh, Forum in Davos. And, uh, Yadir, Yadir Baryal talked a little bit about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and where it was going, and he's now become really involved in the World Health Network where he's been trying to advance the notion of zero COVID. So uh, chapters can introduce you to a lot of the current thinking and issues, but uh, finally, it all comes back to uh, getting to providing a forum for networking, uh, in introducing you to current uh, technical innovations and giving you an opportunity for career engagement by networking and mentoring. And uh, as I guess it was Andy Hirsch, uh, I, I guess it was Alan Kay who originally said that the easiest, the best way to predict the future is to participate in inventing it and the time for the future is now. And with that, I'll take any questions. But I see Bill is here, so maybe Bill will give his introduction now. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for your great presentation. And I think it is really insight, insightful to give the current uh, CS trends and also some other opportunities. And uh, it, is also, it also gives some uh, background about our CS, CS chapters and some other programs. And if there is any question, uh, we can take him uh, via chat. If no, then we can continue with our president elect. Uh, Bill, I say president elect, but uh, he will start as president in next month. 
uh, the William Grob is a, a professor, full professor in University of Illinois Urbana Campaign in US, uh, one of the most prestigious universities uh, all over the world, you know, uh, and he is the uh, 2022 uh, president, CS president. And uh, now the floor is yours, uh, Bill. And uh, sorry for the confusion about the link. <laughs> uh, and we are very glad to uh, host you. And okay, the stage is yours, uh, Bill. Hi. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and um, happy that um, you adapted to the um, little uh, confusion with the links. It's the reminder that we're still working out. <clears throat> How to deal effectively with hybrid meetings. Um, so again, I'm uh, happy to be here. Happy you uh, adapted and moved forward uh, with that. Um, I really wanted to just give a, a, a fairly simple opening and provide a little bit of time uh, for questions because I really think that. Uh, what's exciting about this is as a meetup, it should in fact be uh, a time for doing some uh, uh, dialogue and uh, discussion. So I, I would say that, uh, you know, when I think about the, the role of a professional society these days, it really is to be that a society. It's a place for people who share similar interests, but also different perspectives, backgrounds, history experiences and so forth uh, to come together to learn from each other and organize to solve the <clears throat> many problems that we face today. And, um, you know, in, in the previous talk, you heard a, a lot of interesting things, both about um, many of the different challenges and uh, directions in technology, but also a lot of ways, for example, uh, that the chapters provide ways uh, for uh, students and young professionals to um, join this community and get um, a lot more out of it. Um, I think that it's really important to be thinking about those and the other opportunities that we have uh, in the computer society. Uh, as a graduate student um, and as a brand new assistant professor, uh, going to conferences and having these open-ended conversations with my colleagues and with leaders in computing really helped me in many ways. I made connections that led to collaborations. Those are work and ideas that I really couldn't have done on my own, uh, that I needed to work with other people uh, to accomplish. I learned from a lot of people with more experience on how to, and maybe more importantly, how not to navigate a career, You know what to do and what not to do, um, both in academia and then in the national lab. And I also learned a lot from my colleagues uh, in industry, seeing uh, how they navigated those uh, similar challenges what was different. Um, and I did come across a lot of new ideas that inspired me in my own research and were uh, absolutely critical in my career. And really this is still true. Um, uh, I think it's great that we're able to host these meetings virtually, but I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to get back to meeting you all in person uh, at events around the world. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I attended a C, uh, uh, known as Supercomputing in person. It was held in St. Louis uh, in the United States this year. Uh, In-person attendance was smaller than before the pandemic, but there were over 3,000 in-person registrations. I spent a lot of my time there meeting with uh, current and future potential uh, collaborators, talking with colleagues um, and some competitors um, about future directions in high-performance computing making plans for new projects uh, in ways that I found difficult to do virtually. Um, having said that, once these things get started, I found that we can get a lot more done virtually than I think we often thought. So it's, it's been a, an experience for us to learn from over these last couple of years. Um, there were also thousands of remote attendees. Um, we learned a lot about what worked and what didn't there. Um, and in the future, I think we need to learn how to build on what uh, what we've learned works again and what doesn't um, for the virtual remote participation. Uh, the Computer Society has been a great resource for people. Uh, it's helped a lot of conferences succeed, uh, both as virtual and hybrid. But it's also been a great laboratory where different ideas can be tried out um, at conferences like, uh, like this and events like this to see what works and what doesn't. And I think it's important that we 
take advantage of that laboratory and continue to explore. And again, that's one of the things that we can do as a society um, and that we should, I think, keep focusing on. And so and the Computer Society has been helping communities come together um, and succeed for 75 years. It's really, um, it's amazing to think about um, the length of that history, um, dating back to the predecessor societies of the IEEE. Um, and it's also really remarkable to think about this is the 25th anniversary of the IEEE Young Professionals um, celebrating um, the key role uh, that the young professionals have for our future. So I'd really like to encourage all of you um, to take advantage um, of the opportunities that you have. Um, we heard a lot about some of the opportunities for um, chapters, but there are lots of op other opportunities uh, that I really encourage you to take advantage of. Join a tech community, participate in discussions like this, um, encourage your mentors to find opportunities for you to talk with leaders in the field. Um, we had a great example of a number of the distinguished visitors um, that uh, can talk at uh, chapters. Um, take advantage of those, but not only listen to them, but meet with them. Um, most of us don't bite, I like to say. Um, uh, in fact, I find it really uh, stimulating uh, and rewarding to talk with uh, young professionals uh, about the ideas that they have, the challenges that they're facing. So uh, I really encourage you to reach out. Most of us, I, uh, I think, will feel the same way. Um, and this is gonna be really critical for us as a field, um, bringing together people with the diverse backgrounds, experiences, expertise, viewpoints. Um, we need those to address the opportunities um, and the complexity of our field. And you heard a little bit about that as well. Uh, it's an exciting time to be in computing, partly because a lot is changing. The technologies are changing. The breadth of uh, application, the amount of interdisciplinary is, disciplinarity is growing. Um, and so I think uh, taking advantage of that and uh, exploiting it, uh, advancing the field through it, is gonna require that we all work together and find ways um, to uh, collaborate and grow together. And uh, you know, professional societies are great ways to do that. Chapters are good ways to get started, good ways to continue. Um, but we also have the conferences, of course, publications, I encourage you to you know, reach out, see how you can volunteer, see how you can take one of your passions um, and find other people who share that passion. Um, and so with that, I'd be happy um, in a few minutes, uh, I can take a couple of questions if you uh, anybody has one or I could uh, relate a short story about my own career path. But I, I'd really like to give people an opportunity to ask a question, however we manage to do that. Okay. Uh, if you want, uh, you can ask your question via the chat. Okay. Uh, just let me just let me give a few uh, a few remarks. Uh, okay, uh, we are in COVID era, and uh, it's of course uh, better to make a, a physical meeting. But sometimes uh, it may be impossible to make such a meeting uh, because of the, some other cost issues, some travel and time issues, for example. Uh, now, uh, although we are uh, uh, now we are really doing a global meeting, you are connecting from US and I am from the region A, uh, Turkey, and now uh, we have uh, participants from Denmark, Australia, and Canada, and the virtual meeting gives uh, such an opportunity, uh, and it also uh, it also affects the uh, registration fees, uh, which is very important. And uh, I remember that when I was registered at a conference in uh, 2014, uh, I paid more than 1,000 US dollars. But uh, when I registered my paper in another conference, I paid less than 100 US dollars. This year, SES conference, uh, LCN, IEEE SCN 2021. Uh, so it may it can really affect um, it can really affect the registration fees some costs. Uh, this may be an opportunity, but of course the physical 
uh, meeting are uh, quite useful, quite beneficial uh, because of some other networking opportunities. Uh, and if you want, you can add some uh, some remarks about some networking opportunity or uh, your vision, your career path. Uh, so you can uh, make some uh, closing it uh, or some give the final remark about your speech. Uh, or, uh, and uh, thank you very much for your mm -hmm. uh, time. Uh, and sorry about again the. <laughs> uh, confusion about the, the link. Uh, this yeah. is the uh, sometimes disadvantage about that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So let me just say, I think um, we're we're certainly not going to go back the way things were before the pandemic. The, a, a number of the things that you mentioned are uh, uh, something that's very important for for conferences and for community to um, uh, provide greater um, greater access, greater diversity, um, and so. I think one of the things that's going to be um, both exciting and challenging over the next couple of years is trying to figure out how we recover the best aspects of in-person meetings, the ability to network, the side conversations, um, a lot of things that people have been trying to find technological solutions to with, I will say, maybe mixed success. But at the same time, uh, maintain the value that we've been providing um, just as you've described in terms of uh, broader global access, um, the, the reduced cost uh, to many of the attendees. It will be a challenge for the financial models, but um, there's also uh, many changes in the expenses. So, you know, I would say that we don't have the answers here, but we know that uh, what we're looking at is is change, change that's going to land us in a better spot in the end. And again, something that I think that we're going to be exploring, taking advantage of the ability to use the Computer Society as a big laboratory to try uh, out different approaches to see what works and what doesn't. And what works and what doesn't may depend also a lot on the, uh, the specifics of the community. And again, I think that's another um, advantage we have in the way we've um, organized with both chapters and uh, technical communities and other activities. So um, again, my my uh, uh, call here is there's an opportunity to help us figure this out. And uh, I invite uh, all of you to um, think about how you can uh, help us with that. It, uh, everything from um, just telling us what worked and what doesn't to getting involved with the, uh, the committees, for example, that are managing, uh, particularly for hybrid conferences, um, which is a lot of work, but it's also a great opportunity to explore. So um, again, I think this is, is an example of the best thing that we have out of the society is the ability to bring people together to try to solve some of these hard problems will have a tremendous impact across the globe. Okay. So with that, I, again, um, thank you for inviting me. I, uh, we enjoyed meet, meeting you virtually. Hopes to in the next year to meet um, some, hopefully even all of you in person somewhere. Thank you very much for your great speech and uh, these final remarks. And uh, now uh, we are continuing our uh, panel. Uh, on blockchain and future uh, security trends uh, in the sixth era, and okay, all the all the panelists are here. Now, let's start our panel. Uh, okay, now we are uh, just give. Uh, I'm just looking for a question. Uh, looking for a question. Uh, with the chat. Okay. Uh, yes, no question. It seems like that. And uh, okay, let's continue with the panel. And now uh, we will make a panel on uh, future security tra uh, trends in the cyber physical systems and IoT in the sixth era. 
and we have four panelists uh, from academia and uh, industry. Uh, Professor Sal Kahane from uh, UNSW uh, Sydney, uh, University of uh, New South Wales, Sydney, uh, Australia, and uh, Brock Pantarji from University of Ottawa, uh, Wei Meng from uh, Denmark Technical University, Denmark, and Nasruddin from Microsoft US. Okay, and uh, now uh, I would like to give uh, I would like to give a bit uh, you know a kick of meeting a kick of first. Okay, uh, we are talking about uh, connecting people to uh, connecting people uh, who uh, who have been uh, who have stayed unconnected. For example, when you consider the uh, low income low income countries. Um, for example, in Africa or some other developing or underdeveloped countries, uh, they may have problems of uh, connection, internet connection. So, uh, when you consider the CSI communication side, uh, the researchers look for, look for the solutions to uh, make people more connected. And when you consider the people who are more uh, who have already managed to uh, connect with each other uh they still need more connection what can be uh what are the needs for example okay we have the computers we have uh, internet but with the iot trend we try to connect more and more device uh, our machines our door our home or our factory or quite many things and uh, when you consider the IoT trend in five uh, in five years, uh, the researchers expect uh, more than 50 billion devices to be connected. And when you consider the IoT trend, this new trend brings uh, more connection, more engagement, but also more security threats. And this more uh, this. Uh, security threats needs more effective security solutions uh, with uh, so uh, let's con uh, let's continue with the discuss these security problems and the security solution and now uh, i would like to start with the questions i just uh, want to give uh, a few uh, okay i just, just uh, i was want to uh, start with the general trends sorry about that now uh, i would like to start with the uh, professor sali uh, and then continue with the uh, professor brock and uh, nasruddin and uh, wazy okay uh, what are the security threats uh, in the 5g era and uh, for example 4g 4g lte and uh, what can be uh, what what will be the future security threats in the six year era? what uh, what are, what is your uh, vision what is your opinion about that professor sal thanks uh, <coughs> thanks omer firstly for uh, getting us together uh, i know it's challenging to do this uh, in this setup so thanks uh, and good to see burak wazi uh, and nasir here so uh, <coughs> yeah i think uh, the uh, as you correctly pointed out right we are seeing a lot of uh, devices being connected and more importantly a lot of critical infrastructure is now being connected to the internet so things like the electricity grid things like transportation networks right so i think one of the issues which we're already seeing now is uh, if people can hack into some of these iot devices given that there are so many uh, the attack vector is enormous, right? So even if you can compromise a very small fraction of these devices, it still gives you exposure to some very critical infrastructure. And there have been um, cases where um, people have managed to hack into the smart grids. For example, there are reports where certain government 
actors i won't name specific things here uh, but uh, there is evidence to suggest that uh, such attacks have been launched right and that can be quite critical i mean in fact i remember there was a case earlier this year where someone hacked into some hospital system and i think that led to a death of an actual person in the hospital right so this is just uh, we are sort of realizing that uh, we are in dangerous ter- territory now uh, i mean it's fine to set up uh, lights and blinking things at home but now we are we need to get really serious about this problem right uh, given that all this uh, critical infrastructure is being connected so i think as we move towards sigji and of course people uh, the, all the people here on this um, call are probably already looking into it but uh, given that this is going to just escalate more and more we have to be very careful about putting things out on the market because a lot of things on the market are uh, using sort of haphazard security solutions they are not paying a lot of vendors are not paying proper attention to this and often there is no way to update some of these hardware right so you deploy something and it's very very difficult to actually send a remote update and uh, it's not like your computer where you can just download the latest update from microsoft or uh, apple or whatever right so i think uh, all of this creates uh, lots of issues and uh, of course for us researchers that's good uh, and it gives us problems to solve uh, but yeah uh, these are serious concerns now so i may i pass on to uh, my other colleagues here to elaborate thanks Okay. Uh, what about uh, okay? What about you, Nasir Tin? What do you think about that? Uh, first of all, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, so, based on what uh, um, uh, Salil um, actually said, I'll just elaborate on top of that. Um, so, few of so I've been working on top of that tax, and uh, like. So, as he said, not mentioning the name, but um, so there was a report actually yesterday. I wasn't working on that, but that's Queensland. Um, in the news, it came that someone, probably some uh, national state uh, type of attack, happened down there, right? And then they've been now talking about how to do the business continuity remediation and isolate um, that, and uh, well, so that impact. affected part so that's one example and we, we will talk about like why that happened and then what we have now and then what's going to be in the future um, but it's definitely they were not ready but now the next thing i'd like to discuss hey a uh, few months back we had an attack on us pipeline um, and i'm actually right now working with few of uh, the pipeline and energy operators to identify what's actually going on in their environment so here is a very interesting thing i said identify that actually also means that they are not actually sure how that their entire environment is made of so that also brings uh salil's previous uh a point that uh, it is difficult patching and maintenance it is complicated there's a lot of legacy system um but it also brings the question that because of that previous attack a uh, us at uh, homeland security and tsa that introduce all these mandates and uh, everything but then if the attack really happens to queensland after that are not you prepared so that's one of the big question and then one of the big current challenge with this critical infrastructure that um we've been seeing attacks and then if i talk about a stacks net long time back um we know what can happen right but it's still the the system itself is complicated adopt uh, uh, adopting a modern authentication protocol or communication uh, that is complicated insecure communication i'll just say like and then lack of device to device authentication which right now we are struggling i mean uh, microsoft has a lot of solution but just to put all this solution because the solution aims for modern up uh, systems but those end state plcs and rtus or all these other systems they are using is too old to adopt that that's another problem and then finally um i would say that attacks happening but going for a modernized solution because we have a lot of publication from nist um 
but adapting those and going to that actual solution that's where like the actual challenge belongs and the tsa here from a u.s perspective they have to maintain a, a mandate and put direct uh, uh, directives to those energy sector operators that you actually do this like first mandate was three and then they are saying do more um so they have or else you're gonna get fined so it is that um uh, level and that is severe that um that there are critical infrastructure system, IOTs, it's, it's all growing, but paying attention and adopting and modernizing. Um, so that is a big challenge. Um, but when we talk to the future, um, the research is going on, like industries, a lot of solution out there, uh, but it's still gonna take a long time until those operators or people who are dealing with uh, this critical infrastructure, cyber fiscal, like CPS uh, uh, vendors, operators to go to that level. Thank you very much, Nasir, for your uh, great insights from the uh, industry. We are always talking here about, uh, we are generally talking with the point of uh, academia, uh, especially when you consider the conferences, but also giving the insights from the uh, industry is very important. And thank you very much for your great words. And uh, I would like to continue with the uh, Professor Burak Antarji from University of Ottawa, uh, who has uh, who has a close collaboration with the industry. So uh, he may also give some uh, great insights uh, from both points of uh, academia and industry. Uh, Professor Burak, uh, what do you think about the uh, future trends uh, or the current uh, problems and uh, what is your opinion about uh, the future security threats and also mm -hmm. security trends as social? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, Omar. And um, very nice to see uh, Salil, uh, Nasir and, and Wazi. Thanks for uh, inviting us uh, so we can see uh, <laughs> each other virtually <laughs> um, not in person yet now we're actually um, going through um, a different uh, era um, as you mentioned at the beginning so uh, we are all the uh, the COVID generation now now why am i saying this before um, i move into uh, cyber physical systems and critical infrastructures um, i'd like to just to give some statistics about the uh, the cyber attacks that we have been experiencing since the beginning of the pandemic, because pandemic has not only changed the way uh, that we hold conferences uh, or the way that we socialize, it has also changed the the work practices, including the the, the cyber systems as well as the cyber and, and physical uh, systems together. Now, um, the statistics actually show that even at the um, at the end of the first 100 days after the world health organization declared covid-19 as a pandemic the uh, increase in cyber attacks was 25% now this actually raises a flag for the for the industry for all organizations actually not necessarily the IT industry but all organizations that care for their IT infrastructure um, to increase the investment so the plan here is um, again uh, I'm um, talking based on the statistics 70 percent of the organizations now they are planning to increase their investments on cybersecurity solutions and out of these 70% uh, of the organizations, the key trend is, maybe we will also discuss about this in the next few minutes, 46% of them are also uh, pointing out that uh, artificial intelligence-based solutions are gonna be among their leading investments. Now, this is actually uh, how the industry is now seeing the cybersecurity um, issues or challenges and what is of course based on these numbers it's not actually difficult to forecast that the cyber security industry 
is going to grow tremendously. And I was checking actually um, the data from Grandview Research. So this is actually forecasting a 95% growth of the market size of the cybersecurity industry um, over the next six years. So this is actually, uh, well, not scaring, uh, well, it, it uh, gen creates opportunities for, for the researchers as well as for, for the industry. But at the same time, uh, it also raises uh, a flag and it should raise awareness uh, for uh, protecting the critical infrastructures. And when, when I say critical infrastructures, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take it from where um, Nasser um, Lefty pointed out the uh, critical infrastructures, uh, a very well uh, said uh, speech, a uh, point, very well made point. Now the critical infrastructures that we care for today are the utilities and the, the smart infrastructures like the smart buildings or smart city uh, implementations uh, across the globe. And in addition to that, we have manufacturing systems today that are a part of the critical infrastructures. And we don't mention finance and e-commerce uh, applications and infrastructures among the critical infrastructures, but these are a part of our critical infrastructures. So we should also consider them as well. And what else we have? We have transportation systems. We have connected and autonomous vehicles. Now, this takes us to um, a different attack surface, because when we talk about these critical infrastructures, these are actually not only the traditional cyber systems. So we shouldn't be talking about the in terms of the traditional cyber security uh, terminology, because the attack surface in a cyber physical system is different when compared to a traditional uh, cyber world because you have cyber actions and physical actions se uh, separate. So to model the attacks, to anticipate threats, we need credible and realistic cyber physical threat models to redefine these attack surfaces. And as you also mentioned at the beginning, now we are moving towards the beyond 5G era. As I always mention, I stick with this um, Homeland Security and also NSA, CISA uh, definitions for the threat vectors in, in, for the 5G. Well, we have actually a, um, a policy and standard um, threat vector. We have threat vector that um, targets the supply chain. And there's also the system architecture of the 5G. And the system architecture of 5G um, requires contributions from different angles, including the application layer, network layer, and network slicing, as you know, is actually a, uh, an important component um, in, in the 5G network. So um, that uh, introduces uh, an additional uh, attack surface uh, or threat uh, for the uh, cyber threats uh, in this environment. And a few other uh, um, threats um, we can mention. And on top of this, last but not least, we are not trashing our legacy communication uh, infrastructure when we move towards beyond 5G or 6G, let's name it uh, properly. Uh, we are not trashing the legacy communication infrastructure. So it's not like, you know, bring your old TV and uh, get a new one. No, that legacy uh, infrastructure is going to be there. So we are inheriting the existing vulnerabilities of those legacy communication infrastructures that so the solutions should be holistic that should consider the cyber and physical attack surfaces at the same time they should be um, aware of they should be also addressing the, the vulnerabilities of the existing or legacy communication infrastructure as we are moving towards uh, beyond 5g era maybe i should stop here yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, giving the great insights with the 5G and the 6G era and the communication part. 
and I I also would like to learn uh, the toes of uh, toes Weezy. Uh, Weezy, would you like to uh, add some more points about uh, the future security threats? Okay, so first, uh, thanks Omar for organizing the the panel, right? Because um, I I know it's not that easy, and uh, very glad to see uh, the panelists uh, Sally, uh, Nelson, and uh, Brack here. So actually, uh, good morning from uh, Copenhagen. It's very early here, and uh, yeah, and for uh, for this question, I think it's very important because basically, from the security point of view, uh, we only expect right the necessary. Uh, devices to be internet or interconnected, but uh, for IoT, it basically it, it encourages right everything uh, to be connected, so it can provide many benefits, uh, usability there, and uh, that's true, right? Because uh, for example, in Denmark, actually the government they they like to build, for example, the smart city, right, and also the smart home, and that's why the IoT is the basis for that purpose. So. So, so you can see that the Denmark, Denmark uh, government they also invest a lot in developing some uh, smart things uh, here, right? Uh, including the uh, autonomous uh, uh, vehicle or something uh, there. So I think that's uh, that's why. So we have a motivation, right, to to help to protect the IoT systems or networks there. So. So I'd like to uh, particularly uh, add one thing about the uh, about the threat is the insider attacks because basically for IoT it's a distributed uh, system or network. So the insider attacks they have uh, that they are very powerful because they can access the normal resources right as a normal user. So they know that they may know your basic uh, infrastructure or your your, your network uh, framework there and the know some the locations of your uh, CPS that the critical uh, in infrastructure and also some uh, security uh, mechanisms uh, where they are right so, so they can uh, think about how to bypass that so for the insider attacks uh, I think that would be a very uh, important uh, threats for the IOT yeah and even in in, in the near future. And for the solution, I think we need the trust management. All right. So basically, but but it's not a new concept because trust management we um, have it for many years, and especially for some protecting the critical infrastructure systems. So we we also need to build the trust, right? So, but in some cases, maybe it's not that uh, easy uh, to judge. Uh, some behaviors or, or, or network events, for example, in the 5G or 6G. Uh, in 5G, we have the uh, enhanced mobile uh, broadband, or in 6G, we should have a further enhanced mobile uh, broadband. That means there could be a very large uh, data flows or, or, or data vo volumes there. So it will affect uh, the establishment of the of some of the trust management schemes, because basically, if you want to monitor or to track the status, for example, whether it's the line or malicious of some particular event or, or traffic there, because uh, the traffic the traffic volumes is too large, then maybe it's very maybe it's very hard to uh, make it in an accurate way. So that's why uh, also I, I think also it's the problem when we uh, think about the big data, right? The big data scenario. So I think basically it's the it's the same. But, uh, but right now we have the AI, right? Artificial intelligence and also machine learning, right? So we can uh, apply some of some of these uh, technologies and also the blockchain, right? To help us to build a more robust IoT systems and uh, 5G and 6G. I think that's uh, that's maybe right uh, 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 an important uh, topic in in near future and especially uh, on, on this topic okay thanks yeah thank you very much Vasi, for your uh, words and uh, i would like to uh, continue with a question to uh, directly uh, nasuritin from uh, indasi uh, nasuritin uh, as an industry panelist uh, i would like to uh, in this expert i would like to ask uh, to uh, 
some difficulties uh, you know uh, the difficulties in uh, difficulties to implement the security solutions okay uh, we can design some solutions uh, in theoretically and uh, we can make some simulations uh, we can make some analysis in academia but uh, as an industrial expert uh, what are the uh, implementation difficulties you have already talked about uh, talk about these implementation issues or some uh, problems uh, some challenges uh, but uh, if you want to uh, uh, talk more, uh, we will be glad. Yep. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, so what we have noticed while we got engaged with a few of the customers directly on after Just this... Le le let, let me give... Okay, let me... I say, uh, for example, uh, we, will, uh, we will talk about uh, blockchain a bit mo more in detail uh, yep. or uh, some other security solutions and I would like to say uh, the solutions, the security solutions are really uh, implementable, applicable, or uh, many of them remain as theoretical findings. Uh, so I just uh, I want to ask this one, and uh, if you would give, if you, uh, you know, at least one two example, it would be great mm -hmm. uh, with your personal experience. Okay. Yeah. Um, so first problem was access authentication and access management. The reason this challenge was there is because when, so it's, it's about when firstly they started building this solution, it was all about, hey, I'm going to build an air gap system. No one will access that. So this is how everything has started, right? Because all these operators, they have started from a very long time and operating. Now, slowly then that, as you said, we are, so more speed is coming, more capabilities is coming and we introduce more and more IoT. Now, the next way of thinking is, okay, so right now from isolated system to going to a distributed system and adding more components, more app capabilities, let's go to the hybrid model. So I'm running my air gap, which is no longer on air gap, going to the hybrid model. Um, and then the, the way of thought was what I have seen is few of these solutions, which are legacy solution, um, a work, which work already mentioned, staying there the way it, as it is, not getting upgraded, and then they move to some of the cloud solution or some of the modern solution. So the one that already is very lucrative for the attackers and already has vulnerabilities is staying as it is. They probably wanted to patch in some way, but still uh, quite a bit got unpatched. So that's one problem. Didn't have a proper SIM solution for security event management and um, so, so that they can analyze. And also like when you have the data, quite a lot of those operators have the data, but where to storage it? Because now if you, are you going to build your own data center? They are no. So let's put it on the cloud. Then it's also about adopting like the hybrid situation, how to protect those. So data leakage can happen uh, or happen in some cases. And then about implementing a network, proper network forensic tool. Um, um, and then like an AI based or at least some sort of behavioral analytics on how to analyze what the attacks are coming. So those are lacking. And so, and then based on, so most of the attacks were coming from either like the network gateway level, whether you're maintaining your DMZ properly, um, who is getting authenticated. And I've seen very bad cases where is, um, they are not even audit, I mean, it's bad, but apparently I've seen it, that it's not audited. That, and then multi-factor authentication wasn't there. Um, and then proper IDS, IPS wasn't there. Uh, so with all these, still staying there and so this is what we have seen personally um so that is actually causing the main issue in the industry uh, so it's not about the proper guidelines so guidelines there maybe solutions there is about have we implemented the solution or whoever is running all this infrastructure um they didn't have like a proper plan or proper 
point of control person. So that's very important. And then that's one of the mandate from TSA that you have a dedicated person and dedicated 24 by 7 monitoring of what's going on. Um, so, so all this missing actually caused, I believe, some of the recent um, uh, ish, uh, attacks or uh, problem which we have seen. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your words. And uh, I also would like to uh, continue with the next question. And uh, if you want, then you can give some remarks on the uh, AI applications. Okay, uh, it's uh, become more and more popular. And uh, for example, uh, the European uh, prepares a position statement. The European Public uh, Policy Committee requests uh, some experts from our region, you know, uh, our region, uh, to evaluate their position statement on AI. So uh, people take their position. People uh, try to prepare themselves for the next era, and uh, we have uh, some cybersecurity solutions. And uh, how uh, how AI can be applied to cybersecurity solution can be used in cybersecurity solution. Uh, what it brings uh, to the cybersecurity uh, in security manner, transparency manner, or some other uh, scalability manner. Uh, so, could you give a few words about that from the uh, from the industrial point of view? I say, uh, to, as I say. From the uh, you know uh, from the theoretical point, we can apply, we can do many things uh, depending on the capacity of computer. But when you consider the practical solution, it is a a different point. So I would like to uh, I'm really wonder I really wonder uh, your point of view. Yeah, from industry perspective, I'll 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 tell you about like. So other companies like big ones doing it, but Microsoft invested a lot to be, especially on the cybersecurity market. Um, there is a dedicated machine learning group, not only a dedicated machine learning and AI group, but we have like a threat intelligence and analysis group. So, mm -hmm. and that the main core of the uh, solution which Microsoft is offering is based on uh, adaptive access control, which Microsoft says conditional access. So it analyzes your behavior, your location, uh, so your device, so everything, all the components, and based on that, it does a prediction. So that's the first base of zero trust, which Microsoft actually enhanced on top. I mean, it's from Google and Microsoft already then enhanced it. Now, what the next thing happened is using that uh, for, especially for this uh, um, IoT sector. Um, so with the recent acquisition of uh, uh, one of the company. So Microsoft again, actually rolled from cloud and also on the on-premise, all those agentless type of solution where uh, it's lightweight agent, I'm not saying 100% agentless, but what it does, it collects data based on all the sensors. It can get gather the data and then actually does an automated threat modeling. It can give you, um, at, so it can pick up all the lateral movements. If you have a malware in one of this, even at the endpoint, it can detect and then automatically giving you the entire target path and what can go wrong before anything can go wrong. This prediction can happen. Um, and and on top of that, the main, uh, so it, it also will detect like the CV is there. So if one of the machines, if you, so that Siemens, uh, system what happened on a Stuxnet if I think that um, just just as an example so if you would have this type of solution back then it will just say that hey this PLC or this endpoint uh, had this error now this can go wrong within after uh, five or seven months or something like that uh, and then the final point is which I haven't tested but that's what we've been told that it can automatically even remediate quarantine so i cannot comment on that but we do have at least building this capability of automatic remediation and i'll just add one more very so this is another new project going on it's called bonsai project so what it does is very important uh, uh, interesting it actually does and reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning so 
think you are now running a, 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 a nuclear reactor and you want to model or like an, a, a normal HVAC system in a smart city somewhere um, and then you want to model what can go wrong so with this so you firstly just do all the model in the simulation system and then tell the simulation tell me what can go wrong uh, this is very new it's I, I don't think it's uh, uh, it's is preview that means that work is going on uh but so i guess that's one of the another uh big implementation or big thing will come if this project can go successful like the reinforcement learning based uh, solution of modeling of tra um, what can go wrong thank you very much for your uh, nasir team and i would like to continue with the uh, professor brock uh, with his opinion about the AI application in cybersecurity. Uh, what do you think, Professor Burak, uh, mm -hmm. to, yeah. Yeah, that's actually a, um, an excellent question. Now, for the uh, artificial intelligence and its integration into um, the industry products, actually, um, again, um, I was reading the, um, the report by McKinsey Global, um, and about in about ten years from now, the overall um, global economy uh, will actually uh, be contributed by about thirteen trillion by the artificial intelligence-based products, and a significant portion of these products are going to be also based on. Uh, cybersecurity, new cybersecurity tools and solutions. But there are a few things actually that needs to be addressed uh, before we get to that point. And one of the things is actually we need to change the way that we think and formulate uh, cybersecurity related problems. As Nasir was uh, mentioning, the zero trust, um, the so zero trust based solutions. This is actually um, completely different than. Uh, the traditional cybersecurity approaches, because if you use the traditional cybersecurity approaches, well, you control the actions uh, through the firewalls. So this is actually a perimeter-based approach, right? So you won't, you really don't need to control the the actions or the, or the traffic inside the, the network. But um, the uh, the thing here is um, there might be insiders. Who can also lead to these malicious actions or uh, or, or patterns that would compromise certain assets um, in, in your system? Now, um, what we know today is because that actually paved the way towards this idea. More than forty percent of the um, of the companies now they have um, their employees that work remotely and. 67% of the employees, that's again, based on the same statistics uh, I'm not talking about, more than 67 of the, of the workers, they bring their own devices to work. So that also introduces new um, attack surfaces, new vulnerabilities to the system. So almost two thirds of the employees uh, plug in their own devices into your system every day, right? And uh, the organizations that we know that use cloud-based applications uh, um, use those applications 50% of the time, which also in introduces an additional um, attack surface. Now, um, it is actually uh, now possible to assume that uh, a significant amount of the uh, breaches are going to be originating uh, from inside the network. Now, how artificial intelligence can help us um, detect this is, well, um, definitely uh, using artificial intelligence based uh, tools and methods, more specifically, let's, let's say machine learning based methods, will help us detect these uh, intrusive patterns or even predict these patterns uh, these intrusive patterns even before the attack um, has been launched. So we can certainly do that. But the main challenge and the main concern 
uh, for the industry, as far as I can hear, at least from my collaborators, is the explainability component in the artificial intelligence-based uh, methods. Because um, when you present, when you uh, train your model based on a certain uh, data set and you test it on um, certain attack patterns, you can claim that, well, this is going to give you, let's say, 99% accuracy. Let's forget about accuracy. Let's say, let's talk about F1 scores, right, which is a more reliable score to assess the platform. This is going to give me 99% F1 score, all right? The first question is whether or not your model is going to generalize to another data set. Well, you can still show your data set is going to generalize, your solution, your model is going to generalize to another data set. But the next question is going to be, can you explain this model? Is your model explainable? So white boxing the, the machine learning based solutions in the cybersecurity so, um, models or cybersecurity solutions will be key to rolling these solutions onto products at the industry, uh, for, uh, on the industry's end. So uh, generalizability and uh, explainability are key to uh, these solutions being adopted by the industry. Thank you very much for your great words. Uh, you talk about uh, zero, zero trust and uh, I may miss a point about that. Uh, you, you say we need uh, more zero trust solutions uh, and uh, AI uh, help us to achieve those solutions, right? Uh, AI may help us, of course, uh, achieve those mm -hmm. solutions. So, um, basically, um, how AI can help us uh, or improve those solutions, I, I don't want to say yeah, improve. achieve. AI is actually complementary. So, it mm -hmm. can help us improve those solutions, just like um, context mm -hmm. awareness, for instance, integrating context awareness into the uh, zero trust solutions, for example. Um, so, it's, it's just one example. Okay, I would like to continue with the uh, Waze, uh, Dr. Waze. Uh, what do you think about the uh, AI applications in the cybersecurity solutions in cyber physical systems? Okay, thanks so much oh. for this. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it's a very important um, question. So basically, uh, we can see um, if we because uh, from in the academia, right? Because we we always we review the papers. I can say uh, at least half of the current submissions are relevant to the AI or machine learning, right? So mm -hmm. when we try to develop some of the security solutions, or even we try to develop an attack, we think about uh, artificial intelligence or the machine learning, right? So we always try to uh, automate attack and uh, use the AI or machine learning to help us to establish a solution, a security mm -hmm. solution there. So basically, I think uh, AI is very important to help to enhance the security uh, mechanisms, right? Especially some traditional uh, security uh, mechanisms, as uh, Rex just said. Yeah, so it's very important because it can basically can help to improve the detection uh, accuracy and also the detection efficiency, right? Maybe we can. Uh, detect or identify some malicious events uh, faster, right? So, so that's quite uh, in, in, quite important. And also with the machine learning, we, we don't need, uh, we, can, we, can, we have a good chance to detect some zero day attacks, right? And we can combine it with this, uh, the signature based detections. So basically we can provide, uh, uh, we believe, right? Uh, and uh, a good protection, right? For the uh, assets, right? Or the systems. But I think the, the main problem is that uh, who can, who we can trust when the AI or the machine learning fail, right? So that means uh, we can we cannot only rely on the uh, AI or machine learning to build a secure uh, system, right? Or, or to only based on based on this to build a very good uh, secure solution. So we need to, of course, we maybe we need to think about some some other plus or uh, alternatives, right, to also to back up the AI uh, solutions. Because 
we also need to consider some, there could be some errors, right? Because uh, my main research area is also the intrusive detection. So when we try to have enhanced the performance of anomaly detection, right? Because normally we, we throw out many of the machine learning uh, algorithms there. So we try to uh, automatically detect some attacks and also some, uh, we call the new attacks there, right? So, but it's, it's not that easy uh, to build an accurate model in practice, right? Because basically we know for many machine learning algorithms, we need uh, a large number of the labeled data to train the AI system or the machine learning system, right? So, uh, but in some cases, uh, it's very hard or difficult to get some, for example, the negative uh, instances, especially the, the attack samples to help us to train the AI system. Uh, I think that that's still a problem in uh, in the near in the near future or some some years later because we we still need to think about how we can build an accurate the AI model right only uh, if only given some uh, some few uh, the training data okay and also because uh, in some for example the data, big data area or some in 6G uh, scenario because the data, the data flow or the data volumes are quite big, right? So how to uh, capture or to select some of the most effective features to help us to build uh, suitable the AI system or the AI model, right? That would be very uh, important, uh, especially when the 6G uh, is coming, right? So it, the, the, the data, the traffic uh, is, too, is too large. So how to uh select the features right how to identify some malicious events from the large uh, number of the incoming events that would be a very uh important i think that that's a very important uh, question and also it's a, it should be a very interesting uh, topic for for us like the researchers to investigate yeah thanks that, that's basically my uh, Thanks for your words, uh, Dr. Weezy. And uh, I would like to continue with uh, Professor Salib. Uh, and Professor Salib, as a uh, as a final uh, speaker in this question, uh, what would you uh, want to give us uh, as uh, as your vision? Uh, what do you think uh, about the AI applications? Okay, with the uh, uh, people use AI in the cybersecurity. Uh, solutions in the uh, for the current problems and what do you think uh, how AI can improve uh, not only today but also in the future uh, because uh, AI is also an active area people uh, do active research in this uh, in that area and what do you think about that uh, how AI can improve uh, cyber security solutions in the future thanks so especially much. in cyber uh, cyber physical systems perspective yep so I think uh, my colleagues here have covered uh, quite a lot on that. I may take a slightly different take, particularly more forward looking. So certainly AI has a lot of applications and we are seeing some of this in use in actual products and services now. But uh, there's, uh, it's always like uh, we say it's a cat and mouse game, right? So now, given that we are relying on AI models, people have started finding vulnerabilities in those AI models, right? So it, it is now not difficult to actually attack AI models. There's lots of research, particularly, which has, uh, which has got quite um, numerous um, citations on how you can fool, say, an autonomous vehicle, right? Into the, there were some experiments where they showed you could put some sticky tapes on the speed limit signs and uh, fool the AI model to detect a stop sign as a speeding speed limit sign, right? And that way a car would be fooled into driving through a stoplight um, stop sign essentially. So I think that is uh, also rather concerning and something that we need to uh, be aware of and design AI solutions that are more robust. So there's this whole area of adversarial attacks, which is quite popular in the vision domain, but uh, the same concepts apply when you consider cybersecurity, right? 
if you're using similar models, then those models can also be attacked by hackers. So I think as we move forward, we have to be aware of that and try to design robust ML models. So it's not just sufficient to take ML models and use them, but also be aware of the, of the fact that they could be vulnerable. Uh, thank you very much for your words about the AI. And I would also uh, ask uh, blockchain. We have talked the security uh, and the AI applications and the industry perspective. And uh, the blockchain is a ri- rising uh, part of the game. I, uh, you know, we have uh, I3P blockchain conference uh, under this uh, cybernetic uh, congress. And uh, I know that uh, you have many works in the blockchain. And what do you think? Uh, what do you think about the future of blockchain? Uh, blockchain started with the Bitcoin, and uh, before this session, people uh, still talk uh, uh, Bitcoin, which which can be considered as the blockchain 1.0. And then people consider Ethereum as blockchain 2.0. And then people consider the hyperledger, hyperledger as the blockchain 3.0. And people say that okay, hyperledger goes to the uh, is will become a candidate of future internet. And uh, what do you think about the blockchain? Uh, we can make it. Uh, you know, uh, there are uh, types of blockchain: public blockchain, private blockchain. And uh, they have their own, tra- uh, they have their own uh, trade-offs, security or scalability, uh, or uh, you know, uh, transparency, the control issues, or sometimes people talk about the GDPR issues. They discuss GDPR issues the, before the session, and uh, some researchers say, okay, for the private blockchain we don't need uh, we can uh, ki- uh, we can be co- uh, co- uh, comfortable with uh, suitable with the gdpr we can keep in gdpr by me you consider private blockchain because you own your own uh, you own your uh, data but when you consider uh, public blockchain you cannot control your own the data uh, fully so uh, you cannot guarantee Uh, too com- compatible with the GDPR. So, blockchain uh, brings some new opportunities, but also uh, brings some new challenges. And also the synchronization issue, as I remember, as I see, uh, because they they should also work as uh, synchronized way. And also, when you consider uh, NIST National Institute. Uh, Institute of Standards, I cannot remember the exact uh, exact name, but uh, the NIST uh, already launched a report uh, when we need blockchain. So, it is uh, some people see blockchain as hype, but uh, do uh, does the blockchain has a great uh, potential? Uh, I say a great future. What do you think? Yes, especially in cyber, uh, especially in IoT and cyber physical systems. Yep. Um, yeah, interesting um, points there, Omar. So, um, I mean, yes, yeah, certainly blockchain has certain advantages, as uh, some of you, which you already noted, the fact that it's tamper-proof, the fact that you don't, um, you're not relying on third parties, um, and so on and so forth. But then there are also the trade-offs, right? So some of those you mentioned. Um, Things like um, the energy issue, which we all know. Uh, of course, uh, if we are considering using blockchains in a IoT CPS context, we probably cannot just use solutions like the Bitcoin blockchain. We need to be mindful of uh, what can actually work in the context of IoT. Um, of course, it's not going to provide solve all the problems. It's not going to provide all the solutions. Uh, but I do see some potential for it, particularly when you are looking at uh, needs where you might need an audit trail of all the interactions that have happened, and where you do not have a central point where you could store all these records. Um, so that's where blockchain can certainly help. It can certainly help uh, when you are managing uh, data, particularly. when you are sharing data and you need some view into who actually accessed your data 
uh, how was it shared did they in turn share it with someone else right so right now we have very little view into how these third parties are actually harvesting our data and sharing it so if some of these uh, access records are actually maintained in a secure manner uh, which we have assurances over then uh, that will certainly help uh, but uh, yeah still a lot more work to be done uh, at this stage i don't think we are seeing any enterprise solutions out there that are using blockchains for um, in a wider scale i guess in the iot cyber physical system context but uh, i i do see a potential role uh, along with some of the other ideas we've discussed today thank you very much for your words and uh, what about you uh, dr raise what do you think about uh, the blockchain and its future okay thanks so much for this yeah i think blockchain right technology is quite popular uh, nowadays so i think uh, uh, from the academia i think there's a there's a trend in two fold uh, one is that we try to develop some of the blockchain based applications Another trend, uh, and, and another topic is that uh, you can focus on blockchain itself, and you can try to, for example, to design some new mechanism, for example, the consensus algorithm, or something to help enhance the mm -hmm. blockchain itself. But first, uh, one the blockchain-based applications, I think, uh, of course, blockchain uh, is useful in some particular uh, scenarios. For example, as I just mentioned, uh, it can help to protect the data uh, integrity. And, 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 and that means uh, it can be used to help to desire some uh, security mechanism to against the insider threats, right? Because basically we can check whether the data is uh, altered or not. And then we can, based on that, we can uh, build a more robust trust management uh, mechanism. Because basically for trust, uh, trust ma uh, management, we need to connect the data, right? from different nodes in a distributed system like the IoT or, or, or even a type of physical system uh, there uh, from different components. So we first, we need to ensure that the received data, right, uh, is, the, is the real data, right, without uh, any uh, manipulation or modification there. So based on that, we can build a more robust trust management uh, scheme for that. So here, I think the blockchain uh, is quite useful uh, in that sense. But uh, because nowadays we can see there are uh, too many uh, blockchain papers, but sometimes, especially for some questions, we before we uh, go into the research, we need to think about whether we need blockchain. Because basically, for most cases, we just use the blockchain as a distributed uh, data, uh, database right? for that. So that means we, we need to uh, consider whether we need the blockchain uh, in when we try to desire some blockchain-based applications. So I think uh, one good motivation or solution is that we can to do some survey or to contact the industry, right, the local industry or some uh, some external partners, right, to uh, to learn whether there is a requirement, right, uh, or whether there is a need. So we we need to really uh design a blockchain solution uh, for that if yes then of course you can you can go right in that direction otherwise maybe you need to think about that uh, whether we can uh, we can really apply the blockchain well on the other side of course if we only focus on the blockchain itself of course we can develop uh, or we can try to improve the current uh consensus algorithm right for the blockchain because the scalability uh, is still a major issue for the current blockchain technology for most for most blockchain applications or or, or or some other similar applications so normally when they when the network uh, becomes large right or in a large scale system so normally the current the 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 performance or and the speed of the current blockchain uh, systems right will uh, go down so that's the main issue so of course uh, i think that's a very important topic so to how to improve the existing the blockchain uh, blockchain technology right especially the 
the algorithm also try to make a balance right between the some the consumption, for example, the energy consumption and also the deployments. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That's my idea. Thank you very much, Fizi, for your words. Uh, in fact, uh, you are uh, you pointing out uh, uh, whether we need blockchain or not. And uh, th that is an important point. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the people's needs uh, can be just uh, using a distributed ledger uh, without trust. For example, where you can say WhatsApp, you know, the WhatsApp, the, uh, even the WhatsApp may be enough for the, uh, as a solution uh, because people sometimes need just the communication because all the people trust each other. But we use blockchain when we need trust. Uh, so if you uh, if you collaborate with the untrusted parties, then you need the blockchain. And of course, it, it is a bit complicated issue. And now I would like to continue with uh, Pro, uh, Professor Kantarji, uh, who who has uh, great works, especially in the vehicular area, vehicular communication, vehicular network, and also has the point of uh, view, uh, AI and blockchain. And I would like to uh, ask uh, the future of uh, blockchain in the security solutions, in cyber physical systems, and especially in the uh, vehicular networks. Now, uh, let's uh, move on a bit vehicular networks. Yeah, Professor mm -hmm. Brock. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Amar. Well, to start with uh, the uh, blockchain and, uh, and follow up uh, with the discussions regarding uh, the the blockchains, use of blockchains in uh, in securing cyber physical systems. Well, of course, blockchains are appealing because of their uh, decentralized nature. And it is possible to um, empower uh, blockchains to ensure um, like the privacy of uh, certain participants and to, uh, to ensure to pursue uh, secure transactions. So this is um, definitely uh, all possible and the system can also be protected. I'm talking about a cyber physical system. It can also be uh, protected uh, against any, um, for example, like civil like attacks, for instance, at the proof of work stage, this is uh, quite uh, doable and that can be eliminated. But beyond that, um, my vision for uh, empowering blockchains and integrating blockchains with the next generation networks that includes also the vehicular networks as well i'm, I'm talking about the heterogeneous network the structure blockchains can also be used to uh to bridge uh, some resource providers and also solution developers in a network environment, network environment. So the solution developers are the developers for certain services. Now, and, and resources are provided by uh, certain resource holders. The blockchains can actually uh, play a key role in meeting the, uh, the resource holders and also the service developers or service providers. And the, uh, the the working principle is is, uh, is supposed to be actually uh, again based on a consensus mechanism to be able to obtain a certain level of um, trust score or uh, let's call it reputation for the uh, for the resource holders as well as the uh, service developers in that environment so that we can uh, match them based on the. Um, assessment of the uh, reputations of these uh, of these parties. Now, that actually can also increase uh, the or improve the quality of experience from the users. And now, this is on one end how we can use blockchains in a heterogeneous environment as we move towards the next generation uh, networks and. We, uh, vehicular networks can also benefit from blockchains as well. But on the other hand, in a vehicular environment, what we also need and what, for example, uh, my team is uh, currently 
uh, aiming to achieve in collaboration with our industry partners is security by design. So if we are aiming for security by design, we actually need to go uh, to the lower layers, lower levels of the system. By lower levels, levels I mean uh, even at the radio frequency level. So we should be able to empower, again, going back to artificial intelligence-based models, uh, we should be able to use artificial intelligence-based models to be able to recognize, recognize um, certain uh, transmitter types and certain transmitters in that environment. So that's what we call the fingerprinting solutions. So that will uh, enable us use these, uh, say, deep learning models, not only to discriminate a, a vehicle from a bird or a dog, but it will, or a pedestrian, it will also enable us to obtain the uh, the signals and directly feed this uh, these uh, signals at the lower le uh, level and analyze them through deep networks uh, to um, to fingerprint uh, these transmitters and recognize these uh, these nodes uh, by nodes I mean the vehicles so. That's actually where the where, uh, securing the vehicle and networks uh, in the next generation uh, communications is going through. So we are moving through, uh, towards security by uh, by design. By design means actually going towards the lower layers. Thank you very much. And uh, in fact, we have completed our questions uh, about the uh, cybersecurity threats and uh, the future security threats in the uh, you know six year and uh, we have talked already talked in ai applications and blockchain and uh, the potential blockchain and also the uh, the implementation difficulties in the industry uh, i would like to give a final uh, word to uh, nasri tin uh, how the cyber uh, how the attacks the recent attacks in the cyber physical systems uh, change the mindset of the governments and mandates yep, uh, thank you yeah thank you for that uh, um, we, 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 uh, we have uh, you know uh, we, we are close to uh, we are close to 5 p.m. We uh, we are about to complete. Just some uh, final words, but uh, I think it will be great words from uh, industrial expert from Microsoft. Thank you very much, Master. Yeah, you yep, can continue. Thank you. Yep, I'll I'll be short. Uh, the first is um, definitely it changed the mindset from government because we are seeing right now the government is actually giving directives and imposing fines. Um, so that means that, hey, all the operators, you follow this or you will incur fines. It's not super complicated, but the way, at the, at the same time that the government, the way they have published it is one mandate is public, another mandate is hidden. So only specific people can access that. So that also means that if I now tell you that I have seen that mandate, I can actually go to jail for that so but it's that secret right but it also means that it's very serious the government has taken it seriously um, and now if we are going to the actual operators what's happening um, so they are going outside the boundary of their traditional way of thinking uh, previously they probably thought that hey we've been running this business without upgrading our system, without thinking to get rid of our legacy system and without even redesigning. But now um, they are very serious. They've been talking to different vendors. We are one of them and, and other vendors of how to actually um, upgrade those legacy system or at least implement uh, what the, the way the government wanted them to implement the second factor solution with I cannot talk more detail, but there are some specific details how to do that. So that is an entire paradigm shift. And I would say the mindset shift of 
all the executives of these companies so, um so with this era of and and at the same time i'll just attack these days one bad thing about ai is i was just reading a research paper how you can actually now use ai to attack iot systems so now the smart uh, i mean i'm not going to say those are smart people but people who are sidetracked using iot for attacking so more vulnerabilities will come so so this uh, uh, so, uh, with the government influence and the uh, uh, of these recent attacks, um, now the way of thinking and way forward uh, thinking will be: let's uh, adopt all the guidelines and um, uh, try to learn how to actually live with um, recognizing um, investment versus. Uh, not doing any investment of how to remediate or how to like uh, 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 reduce my attack surface. So, so that's saying that I'll uh, conclude. So I don't want to just uh, overrun this meeting. Uh, so, th so that's my perspective and what I have learned recently. Thank you very much for your great pers uh Okay, and uh, now uh, we are finalizing your uh, panel, and uh, I would like to uh, thank our great uh, panelists, Professor Salil Kahane from Euro uh, University of New South Wales, from Sydney, Australia, and Waze Mek from Denmark Technical University, uh, and Nasrettin from Microsoft US, and uh, Professor Burak Kantaji from University of Ottawa. Uh, and it was really great to uh, discuss the cybersecurity threats uh, and trends, future uh, trends in the 6 year era, in, especially in cyber physical systems. And we also discussed uh, the AI applications and its future, and also the future of uh, blockchain. You know, it is a, a new trend, and uh, people organize the, even the conference so based on the uh blockchain as you can see in this uh as i itp blockchain conference under this cybermatic uh, congress uh and also we uh, talk the vehicular network uh and uh, the air application blockchain application in the uh, vehicular network vehicular communication and also how the cyber physical uh the attacks in the cyber the cyber physical systems uh affects the uh, point of view uh, of the governments, their perspective, uh, the government's perspective, and the mandates. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, participation. Uh, I would like to uh, thank these great speakers uh, to give this great speech and these great insights about these topics. And now uh, I will just uh, want to give a uh, short introduction about the CSSYP. Uh, and if you have any question, you can write via the chat. And uh, thank you very much, uh, great speakers again. Uh, now, just I would like to uh, wait a minute. Uh, okay. Not the, this one. Uh, okay. Just this one. Don't this meeting. Okay, could you see the screen? Okay, my slides. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to just uh, give a, a, a bit. Uh, you know, uh, I would like to give a short summary of the CSSYP activities. Uh, as I said, uh, I am the ITP Computer Society SYP Activities Committee, was chair responsible for WIPE activities uh, and also the organizer of this uh, CSYP meetup. And uh, uh, okay, now. I would like to talk shortly about uh, this CSYP uh, initiatives. Uh, 
اوکی دی سی اس لیس تاک اباوت دی تی پی سی اس ام چی بورد ان اس وای پی دی آی تی پی سی اس ام چی ممبران جاب اکتیویتیز بورد فوکوس اون تو پرووایڈنگ مور اپورچونیتیز تو ایتس ممبرز سی اس ممبرز دی سی اس وای پی ممبرز اند اسٹوڈنٹ ممبرز اند ایت هاز فور کمیتیز جورفی اکتیویتیز کمیتیز یو ریممبر پیتر Uh, Peter, Peter talk after uh, Peter uh, initiates our uh, meetup with his talk and uh, he is the MGA board vice chair responsible for geographic activities committees and uh, also the uh, we have student and young professions activity committee uh, the organizer of this uh, the organizer of this meetup is uh, the student and young professions activity the SYP, CSSYP, and also we have awards and recognition and also special technical committees. As I remember, we have 19 technical committees which can consider uh, com uh, computer communications, uh, AI or uh, blockchain, and quite many uh, special technical committees we have. Uh, you can check them via our website. And Let's focus more on the CSSYP. In the CSSYP, uh, we would like to start some initiatives to address the needs of the students and young professionals. And we are generally organizing the uh, global activities or sometimes help the uh, regional uh, student units or YP units, sometimes collaborate with them, but we are a global community. Uh, we are the ITRPCS Global SYP Committee. And uh, so our initiatives targets generally uh, all people, all the students and young professionals all around, uh, all over the world. Let's talk shortly about uh, some of the initiatives. ITRPCS Scholarship Outreach Initiative. ITRPCS provides three scholarship or award. Richard Marion Student Scholarship, Upsilon P. Epsilon Student Award, and Larson Student Paper Award. Uh, and for the, this one, the Richard Marion Scholarship, we have a RAM and uh, RAM help desk. And also for the UPE, we have another uh, help desk. Uh, we also have uh, Lance Stafford Larson Outstanding Student Paper Awards, uh, Paper Contest. Uh, I'm also a, a third place recipient in the 2019 Lance Stafford Larson Paper Contest. And uh, this is more academic research based than the others. These are, although they say co uh, academic, they are generally uh, coursework based. Uh, they look for coursework, coursework based uh, academic uh, success. But in this one, they look for uh, your research ability. And uh, with this SOI scholarship outreach initiative, we try to help the uh, applicants, the scholarship or all the applicants, and we try to mentor them and guide them uh, to make their application better. And uh, thus they can uh, tell, the, thus they can uh, tell themselves better and make a better application. And also we have ITRP uh, CS Global Student Challenge 2021. In this uh, one, uh, we have the following words, uh, the following motto, create, solve, in innovate and compete. And it is more on the uh, students, uh, the undergraduate students. And uh, in this challenge, we provide two challenges, analyzing a computer system, usage and failure data from university center computing system. And as a second challenge, we provide analyzing sentiments in tweets it's related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, based on these challenge problems, uh, we expect, uh, we wait for the solutions from the students. And these are the numbers uh, from all over, all around the world. Uh, all over the world uh, who participate in the ITPCS Global Student Challenge in 2021. 41 countries, uh, nearly 500 students and more than 200 te uh, teams and nearly 200 universities. 
Ben Dizardı, I3PCS, Global Student Challenge uh, 2021 winners. You can see uh, our winners are from uh, Region 9, Brazil, Region 8, Saudi Arabia, uh, China, in, uh, Indonesia, and again China. We also have ITRP uh, CS DVP Distinguished Visitor Program and SYP Virtual Conference. Uh, in fact, this conference is uh, start last year. This year we can we couldn't do that conference uh, because we are organized. We focus on the CS SYP Congress. I will talk about that. And uh, in this conference, but in this CS DVP conference, we focus on generally the uh, training topics. Mainly cybersecurity, I can say that the as I remember, okay, hot topics in cybersecurity. Uh, in the two-day cong uh, congress uh, conference, uh, we uh, bring uh, many uh, cybersecurity experts, uh, and we reach hundreds of uh, we reach hundreds of people uh, and uh, bring them as uh, cyber uh, bring them. Uh, uh, you know, a series of cybersecurity uh, webinars, I can say, cybersecurity lectures. So we have uh, more than 10 speakers and we have nearly 1,000 registrations, registrations. And these are the, uh, these are the least of these initiatives. And also we have just started the uh, ITRPCS Tech Initiative. It is a collaborative initiative, SYP, uh, Special Technical Committees, and DVP Collaborative Initiatives. And uh, we focus on tech, train, lead, engage, and unique. Uh, we try to combine, we try to benefit, uh, benefit from these committees. And uh, okay. It says it is an umbrella event, commence the session on emerging technologies, soft skills, leadership. So uh, we are, uh, we encourage uh, the chapters, the student chapters, the sex, uh, sub uh, or regional, uh, regional committees to organize the CS tech event, the support of CSS pipe. These aims, uh, the global initiatives uh, to scale uh, the, uh, the global initiatives to scale down to the region or sub areas. So, if someone wants to organize such a congress, then CSSYP tries to help them. And you can see uh, it is a collaboration of not only SYP. Uh, and DVP, but also special technical committees. And besides this, we also use, uh, we also collaborate Jack. So uh, you can see uh, four, com uh, you can see there are four uh, committees uh, who col uh, which collaborate with each other uh, uh, to provide this great initiative. And also, SYP social media outreach. Uh, when you consider this, uh, SYP social media, uh, we try to reach more and more people. In fact, in uh, with each uh, event, we uh, reach more people and people subscribe our uh, social medias to learn more and more uh, our initiatives and our past initiatives and some of our initiatives, uh, the results of some of our initiatives are on uh, ITP Computer Society YouTube channel. You can follow them uh, and some of them, some other uh, can be uh, given in other uh, YouTube channels or uh, you can follow our social media to reach uh, more information about them. And these are our social media accounts. You can see them. In Instagram and Facebook, we use I3PCS SYP. 
and uh, when you consider LinkedIn, when you write I through Country Society as well, you can reach our LinkedIn uh, account and also we have Twitter account. And by the way, we also have I through PCS Learning Webinar Series, Build Your Career Webinars, and 2021 Technology Prediction Report. Uh, this is a technical report. Uh, this is the report by the IPCS, uh, and we provide this report for the YPs to learn the future, uh, the technology prediction. So, to predict the future trends, uh, to learn uh, the future, uh, the prediction, and prepare themselves to the future. And we also have IEEE CSYP meetup. Uh, excuse me. We also have IEEE CSYP micro mentoring program. As YP, uh, we are a critical phase. We are not student. Uh, we are professional, and but we are not major professional. We are young. We try to bring the youth, the youngness, and uh, uh, professional. Uh, part so young professional is an interesting era of uh, people's life i think it is a very important and uh, it determines your future career so what you do in your young professional era will affect your future career so uh, it is very important uh, to find the right path uh, we always look for the right path in our career or in our life and when we consider the mentoring, micro-mentoring, in this micro-mentoring, uh, we try to uh, provide a mentoring opportunity. Let me short to summarize it. Uh, we have three states, finding and mapping uh, mentor mentee pairs based on common interest goals and expectations and providing right platform for the mentor-mentee relationship to flourish. We are still looking for that. Uh, and also the setting the participants to grow beyond the program. Okay, by peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. We have a program uh, and let me say that we have two tracks, academy and industry. We have some criteria about the mentors. Uh, for example, we expect uh, eight or 10 years uh, for the uh, industry and also academia uh, and we uh, we we wait at least um, we expect at least six month relation I say relation six month contact with the mentor and mentee and uh, also uh, the mentors can be non CS members and the, but the mentees have to be CS members YPs so uh, this is a service this is an opportunity for the YPs who are also CS members, but uh, the mentors can be non-CS members. They can be a great uh, expert, industrialist expert or academics, especially in the industrial expert. Uh, so uh, the CS membership is not obligatory for them because they are the uh, people who give the service, who help but the people who receive the help, we expect them to be CS members. We, pro we try to provide this opportunity to the ITRP CS YP members. And the call for mentors is still open. And also we have ITRP CS student leadership program. Uh, we have CS uh, Learning Web Series, student leadership program application submission. In fact, in CSSYP, we also have, uh, we also provide uh, quite many opportunity to uh, students, undergraduate students. So uh, you can follow them via our uh, social media accounts, our websites. When you write uh, ITRP Computer Society SYP Activity Committee, you can see uh, our website and uh, our social media accounts to follow them. Uh, ju just okay. Okay, ITRPCS uh, uh, Global SYP Congress. 
uh, we aim connect advance and lead we organize the congress in uh, 23rd and uh, 24th october and uh, you can see me there and uh, in that congress we organize with that congress we organized the first uh, society based SYP Congress. I say society based to the best of knowledge, none of the societies organize such a Congress. So we are very proud to organize uh, uh, SYP, Global SYP Congress uh, as ITPC SYP Committee. And in this Congress, uh, we welcome uh, we welcome nearly 15 uh, session, 15 speaker. Uh, and we uh, we receive more than 200 registrations. Although it is the first uh, CSS by Congress, and I think it will uh, improve much in the future years. Uh, in this global congress, uh, we bring the ITPCS president, the current CS president, for a show, Professor for show and uh, then we continue with the technical session entrepreneurial session the professional development sessions and some some technical sessions for the uh, beginner level uh, and also uh, we provide two networking uh, networking session one of them is with the regional coordinators as i am also the itrp computer society region aid coordinator uh, I come, uh, I make the connection with the regional coordinators and the, uh, the participants uh, for them to engage more and more their region because in the regional level we also need some volunteers. Uh, we have quite many volunteers, but uh, in the CS this year we pro, uh, we form some new committees and new committees bring some new volunteering opportunities. So it is better for you to uh, also look for that committees under the geographic and activity geographic activities committee. Uh, And let me uh, say some a few words about that. Uh, I'm about to end my presentation. The CS activities for uh, early career professions for members and non-members. Uh, we have early career webinars and future competing leader talks. Uh, these are in development. Leadership Thursdays in development. Uh, I remember uh, our membership manager, uh, Eric uh, Berkowitz, such as it in uh, two months ago. Uh, so uh, it is still under development. And the regional student and early career conferences. Uh, this, is about, uh, this is about to scale down. Uh, we organized uh, ITRP uh, CS Global SYP Congress successfully. And now we try to scale up, uh, scale down uh, to the region. So uh, if, for example, the uh, if a region, a CS region, a regional committee aim to organize a Congress, then uh, we'll try to help them about their initiatives. And ITRPCS SYP activities, growing impact through the member engagement. Yeah, we try to engage more and more uh, members to the CS. And uh, as SYP, we try to provide more opportunities, more volunteering opportunities and initiatives to uh, CSYP members and also student members. And thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have any questions, uh, I will be glad. Uh, just let me say that uh, beside these activities, we uh, we have already made some uh, meetup. For example, in the uh, just let me say that uh, ten months ago in February seven, uh, we organized the first uh, global uh the first global csyp meetup and the interesting thing is uh, none of the societies have uh no societies hadn't organized such a meetup uh, by inviting the yp chairs 
the all over the world. We invite all the YP Affinity Group chairs all over the world, uh, more than uh, 200 YP Affinity Group chairs. Uh, I invite all of them. Uh, and besides this, we invite all the regional uh, YP coordinators and society YP uh, leaders. Uh, because as CSSYP, uh, we try to um, connect more and more with the YPs and uh, we try to provide more opportunities and we try to uh, outreach uh, more people. Uh, this, is, uh, this YP meetup is a part of this uh, aim, this goal, this vision. Uh, and I think, uh, and we think, uh together we can do uh, many great things uh, many more great things so uh if you are a cs volunteer if you uh if you like cs if you want to be part of cs uh i kindly suggest you to uh, show more interest in uh, our uh, committee css 5p committee at least show interest and then you may find some opportunities for yourself uh and uh it will be better for you to express yourself uh let me say a final word volunteering is a part of uh, wanting is a way for you to express yourself because uh you will find the opportunity to solve your own problem uh because you lead some subcommittees you lead some committees uh and the i3p i3p cs provides uh that opportunity or become a part uh, become a part of these opportunities sometimes some other people may lead that committees but still they may need the volunteers so uh you may join the committee you may join the way you may learn and you may improve in the future. Yeah, these are the my uh, final words. And uh, okay, uh, by the way, uh, Jibin was also uh, here. Uh, Jibin is our industrial perspective. Uh, uh, Jibin is our industry, uh, is possible for the CSSYP industrial uh okay. outreach uh so uh, he may give some uh remarks about the cssyp uh yeah Jimmy. yeah uh thanks omar uh, yeah uh yeah so uh yeah we lead the industry outreach and industry relations and outreach basically so what we try to do is you know find out wherever IGP Computer Society members can contribute to the industry as well as, you know, get uh, companies to work with us to, together to build. Um, am I audible, Amar? Hmm? Am I audible? Uh, what you say? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so basically what we do is uh, we work with student branches and uh, basically all the organization units under IEEE to, you know, work with industries across the globe and help them get hired faster. That is one of the major things. And the other one is to b help build students the skill sets required as per the industry standards. Let's say most of the students, even from IEEE or like even outside IEEE, what happens is these students don't have the skill sets required for the industry. So what we try to do is we help them build it within IEEE and connect them with the industry whenever required. If you have any questions, just let me know. So, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, uh, we will finish in a few minutes. Uh, Jibin, uh, do you have, uh, you had an initiative as I remember? Uh, yeah, so that is, so, so what we are doing is we are uh, trying to contact all the so we are planning to do a program wherein you know it's completely hybrid for next year wherein we bring top industry leaders from across the globe and 
probably it would be one week whole program we are planning for may or june next year so we would like to invite everyone to, you know bring on ideas like whichever speaker that you would like to have us uh, for the event so we can try to bring them on thank you very much shubin uh Thank you very much for your patience uh, and uh, sorry about the latency. We start a bit uh, late uh, because of uh, the, some misunderstanding about the links. And uh, thank you very much for your patience, your uh, valuable time. And it was really great to make this meetup and uh, talk with these great speakers uh, and seeing these great attendees. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can. Uh, check our website and uh, I will also uh, uh, provide some other links to reach out and if you have any question you can write here and if no question then uh, I wish a great uh, congress and I wish you uh, a great lecture in the uh, in the next session thank you very much for this great opportunity <laughs>